Good morning. If I don't know you, my name's Bethany, and I get the pleasure of reading the Bible for you today. So we're looking at 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. And if you have a Bible from up the back, it's on page 1051. One Timothy chapter two verse one. First of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Saviour, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. For this I was appointed a herald, an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument, also, the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing, with decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess to worship God. A woman is to learn quietly with full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was firmed for formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. But she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with good sense. Thank you, Beth, and good morning all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we know it is good. Uh, we pray that you would help us to not sit over it today, but to sit under it. Uh, for as your people, we trust that you know what is best for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone loves the crazy mirror. I love the crazy mirror. There's nothing, technic, uh, nothing advanced about it. But it makes you laugh, doesn't it? You go to the fair, you go to Luna Park, suddenly you are 10 foot tall which for some of you would be a joy, wouldn't it? For others of you, you're one foot tall. And then your body is bent and stretched and suddenly you laugh at yourself. Well, we have been exploring the vital questions of identity over the last three weeks. Because who you think you are shapes our sense of value and purpose. But it is a hard journey, isn't it? Because our world presents a crazy mirror of self. Watkins says this. In the modern day, I do not build my knowledge on, of self on something outside of me, i.e. God, but on my own inner self-awareness, my own thinking. I am the single architect of my own knowledge. We're all gods now, with the freedom and prerogative to say... I am who I am. I think he's captured our world very well. Because we're surrounded by warped mirrors that create confusion and pride and poor behaviour in all of us. Not just the misogynists, not just the toxic males, and not just the trans activists. But as God's people, we know there's a better story. And we see an unwarped picture of ourselves in God's word, which is God's mirror. When we look deeply into God's mirror, his word, we are blessed with clarity and comfort, James 1.25. And we see we are not self-made, we are handmade. Our value comes from the master craftsman's hands, not our feeble self-discovery. We see we are wonderfully different. God made us men and women with different roles, which reflect the beautiful diversity of the Trinity. 
and create complementary co-workers in God's world. In the Bible, we see we are all corrupt image bearers. We have disordered desires and disordered actions. Yet through God's grace, we are equally saved as men and women, and we are equally co-heirs with Christ. And God's grace is slowly changing us from the inside out to be like Jesus. So God's word, God's mirror, it gives us comfort and clarity. But it's been an uncomfortable three weeks, hasn't it? Because what God's word says is countercultural. But if we are Christians, God gets the first and the last word on who we are. So today, we're looking again into God's mirror as we go back to 1 Timothy. And we're learning about how to be God's household. And in chapter 2, Paul turns his focus to the Sunday gathering, what we're doing here this morning. And in the first century, church gatherings were a little unpredictable. The New Testament letters, if you've read your Bibles, you'll know that there, there was heresy. There were special seats for the powerful in some churches. There were fallouts publicly. And in some churches, the Lord's Supper had turned into a boozy dinner party for some wealthy people. The Ephesian church had its own issues. There was a group of false teachers, mainly men, who were denying God's good creation order through biblical speculation. And this was creating division and an inward focus in the Ephesian church. It was derailing the church from their primary purpose, which was to hold up and out God's good truth. And so in our letter here, Paul is writing to Timothy to help the Ephesians be wonderful worshippers. Because the way we gather on a Sunday is part of holding out God's truth to the world. And so today in our passage, God has got a word for all of us, for the men and for the women. Number one, a reflection of our heart. Don't you love being a fly on the wall as kids play? Or as teenagers talk, less so maybe. <laughs> you can tell so much about a person by what they talk about. And it's the same in God's household. People can tell what we care about by what we pray about. See it in verse 1? First of all, primarily, I urge that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone. A healthy household of God will pray big gospel-shaped prayers for all kinds of people in all situations because the gospel changes our focus from inward to outward so we will make requests for specific needs we will pray for specific people we will appeal on people's behalf we will give thanks for brothers and sisters our nation and other nations for everyone now, just to be clear that everyone means everyone, look what Paul says. I want you to pray for the ruling class, even for cruel and vain Nero. This is a remarkable sentence because there was no Christian ruler in the world at that time. Yet Paul says you are to pray for everyone. A healthy household of God will show its heart in its prayers. Why? Because that's the heart of God. See it there in verse 3? This is good and it pleases God our Saviour who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's beautiful, isn't it? God cares about everyone. He made every single person and he wants people from all over the world to be saved into his family. Now, in this verse, Paul is not talking about the extent of atonement. 
He's not talking about election and responsibility. What he's saying is that no nation, no rank of society is excluded from his salvation. That Jesus is for everybody without distinction of race, with, without distinction of colour or condition or status. They all need God's salvation. See verse 5? For there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. Why do we not just pray for OEC people and we pray for everyone? It's because we know there is one God, not two, not 20, not 100, one God only. Every other God is imaginary in the world. And we know there is one mediator who paid the ransom 2,000 years ago to reconcile humanity and God. What Paul is saying here is there is no relationship with God without Jesus. And so God's heart is global because he wants all people to be saved. And God's people get that when they pray externally about people's needs for Jesus. And I think that's what shapes our prayers for kings and rulers. Go back to verse 2. What do we pray for kings and rulers? We don't pray that they become less mean or that God would somehow move them off the chair and put someone else in. See what we pray for? We pray they would keep the peace. We pray they would preserve law. We pray that they would punish evil. Why? So the household of God can lead a quiet life. Note that word quiet doesn't mean silent. It doesn't mean silent life. What it means is an ordered life and a life where we can get on with worshipping our God and spreading the gospel from orange to the world. If the gospel is going to go out to everyone, think about that, then it really helps if the roads work and the internet works. It really helps when the bandits are under control. It really helps when wars are ceased. It's really helpful when governments do their job. And so God says, pray for them so that mission can happen. So what would a fly on the wall here in our prayers? Think about that. Our world's crazy mirror says, focus inward. And sometimes on our Sunday, not very often, but very often in our growth groups, and hear this everyone, mostly our growth group prayers are about us. We share our prayer points about ourselves. What would a visitor say about your growth group, about what you care about the most? Because our prayers reveal our heart. And we share God's heart for the world. And a newcomer will see this in our prayers. Well, the man box um, has many titles, but it is the title of a study in Australia of the attitudes of young adult men to manhood. Inside the man box are things like men need to be self-sufficient, men need to be physically attractive, men need to be hypersexual, men need to be aggressive, men need to be controlling, They're the kind of views of our world. Now, we know those views are spread by influences. I'm not going to name them. They don't deserve it. But actually where it comes from is the warped mirror. That warped mirror we're always looking into. It's every time we turn on the TV and YouTube and we listen to our world. That warped mirror leads to the man box of that masculinity. But what's a real man? Well, God's word has so much good stuff, brothers. From Genesis to Revelation, so much good stuff on what it means to be a godly man. But here's one, just one. Look at verse 8. Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? Since God's desire is to save everyone, what's therefore for you? I want every man in every place lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. What's the mark of a godly man? It's not dominance. Dominance. It's not violence. And it's definitely not always being right. Godly men lead God's household in prayer for the salvation of the lost. 
the hands raising is, an, is a cultural thing, but it's an outward expression of an inward reality. Fighting men, you make, we make our hands dirty, impure, but God's holy men, sorry, God's men are holy because they've come before God as sinners with open hands saying, yes, I'm guilty. They've been washed by Jesus and now they love and serve God. That's what a godly man is. And so that godly man then leads God's household in that same journey. Godly men say, brothers and sisters, we need to confess, we need to repent, and we need to depend on our great God. That's godly manhood. And see the challenge here? Paul's challenge is for all Christian men. The maintenance team is for some Christian men. Music is for some men. Kids church is for some men. God calls all men to lead in prayer. Not just up front, but in our friendship groups, in our families, and in our growth group. He doesn't say pray with perfect words, does he? He says, no, your heart is to help your brothers and sisters to love and depend on Jesus just like you. Now, why, why is this a big deal? Because as a family is impoverished, when dad does not step up to lead their family in prayer, the family becomes impoverished. So the household of God is impoverished if men sit back or if men just fight. Men set the tone of God's household in how they pray. The men who built OEC alongside, their, alongside godly women were men of prayer. Not gifted men, they were men of prayer. And so today, brothers, we need God's help. Because we need God's help to fight our inward focus of fear, I'm too scared to do this, or I'm too insecure to do this, or I just don't need to do this, I'm better than this. Actually, we need forgiveness. Because we are so much happier to talk about footy and soccer and camping and DUI and work more than leading someone in prayer. We need forgiveness. Because brothers, can I say this? Our sisters and wives, they don't need you to work longer. They don't need you to work more hours. They don't need you to pay the mortgage off. They don't need you to control their social lives, how much they can go out or who they can talk to. They don't need you to step back in the shadows like Adam did, Genesis 3. No, no, they want us to lead everyone into the throne room of God. That is what heavenly men do. In verse 9, Paul addresses women. Some want to cancel Paul for these words. You may want to cancel Paul for these words. Others use inferences and assumptions to kind of airbrush these words out of the Bible. Or they just don't apply because of some kind of in, yeah, inference or con context scenario. My friend Ruth, she's a dear sister to me, and she shared this great wisdom on her blog. It makes me feel angry, talked down to, made to feel inferior. It makes me think Paul is a misogynist jerk. I know this is not Jesus' view or Paul's. It is the impact of my culture on how I read my Bible. As we have seen throughout chapter 2, God's purpose in this chapter is missional. It is all about God's household holding up and out God's truth. That's what he's doing here. That's why you see the therefore and the likewise and the fours. In 9 to 15, Christ's apostle, apostle is calling women to godliness for mission. Number one, adorn. In the Roman world, your dress and your accessories communicated your identity. So the slave wore a tunic. The senators, the Roman senators, they wore purple. And the high-class prostitute wore beautiful headpieces, pearls, and expensive clothes. 
And she wore those things to scream, look at me. Now, some women in the church were using their dress, their externals, to wield power. And what Paul is doing here in 9, to 10, 9 and 10 is calling women to be godly. That's it. See verse 9, also the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing with decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls or expensive apparel, but with good works as is proper for women who profess to worship God. Let's be real clear. Paul's not telling women what to wear. He is not talking about certain clothes brands. He's not talking about whether you should go to a hairdresser or what level of hairdresser. He's not saying don't dress up and feel good when you dress up. He's not saying any of that. He's being far more challenging. <laughs> far out. That is not challenging. This is what he says. What he's saying is, women, how does your outside reveal your heart? How does your outside reveal your heart? Because Jesus loving women... Love, sorry, Jesus' women love Jesus more than anything in the world. And that shapes how they present themselves to others. So Jesus' love, Jesus loving women, they don't copy the world, which is all about creating an external image that people will like. That's what the world does, right? No, godly women, they freely choose to reduce the focus on their outsides with modesty and restraint, and instead, I love this word, they adorn themselves with good works. What a beautiful word. Adorning myself in good works, like looking out for strangers, caring for the afflicted, teaching younger women, all the good works, because their outsides are revealing who they love the most. I regularly praise God for the godly women of OEC. Because they show who they love most in their words, dress and action. They unashamedly love Jesus. In verses 11 to 15, Paul focuses on learning in the Sunday gathering. See, learning is important because learning leads to godliness and a household effective in holding up and out the truth. And so as we work through what Paul is saying here, very carefully, we're going to start with the things we miss. I think we miss the positive aspect. The Romans treated women as intellectually inferior. And they saw educating women as a waste of time. It was Jesus who upended this, who encouraged women to learn from him. And the early church was revolutionary because Acts 2.42, men and women devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. And likewise, Paul is adamant that women should learn, get their hands around the Bible. We also miss the link between verse 2 and verse 11. I've already mentioned this, but see the links? The word for quiet doesn't mean silence. It is a state of good order where, verse 2, evangelism can go out because the government's got things in order. And in verse 11, where learning can flourish in the gathering. When we have disorder, whether by governments or false teachers or men and women exerting their rights to do what they want, that limits God's work. And so what Paul is doing here is calling women to practice reverence in the gathering. Why? So learning can thrive. I think we also miss that submission is godly. Submission may be a yucky word in your mouth, but can I just say, it's godly. It is never something a man can demand you do. Can I just say that? Men can never tell you to submit. That is never the use in the Bible. No, no. Submission is voluntarily putting yourself in an ordered relationship and acting appropriately. Jesus submits. The eternal Son of God freely submitted to his Father in obedience. You can only be a Christian if you submit. Because being a Christian is saying, I am not a king. 
God is my king, I'm going to submit to Jesus. Through the New Testament, God calls Christians to submit in various ordered relationships as an expression of your trust in God. To sit in church and be unwilling to submit is actually a symptom of pride, not godliness. We also miss, I think, the plain reading of the passage. Paul is saying that women are not to teach in the corporate gathering. He is not saying that women should not speak in church. They are to pray. They are to prophesy in an ordered way. He's not saying women should not teach at all. Paul regularly calls and encourages women to teach other women and in other spaces. He is not saying a woman should not take initiative. Phoebe financed Paul's ministry. She took the initiative to make sure the mission could go to the world. Paul is not saying a woman can't help men theologically. Priscilla helped Apollos' theology in the private of his home. He is not saying women are less able or less gifted. He is not referring to the world, to the leadership of schools and nations and hospitals. He's not referring solely to women's problems in Ephesus. What Paul is saying is that women are not to teach in the corporate gathering for this will lead her to taking authority over a man, which is not the good order of God's household. In this passage, to teach means to teach. That's what it means. It means to help people learn. It is to explain God's word and apply it in the gathering. And so in our context, it's the Sunday sermon. The teacher on our Sunday morning, they have authority. Why do they have authority? Because this has authority and the, the, the space that you're in, the person giving the sermon has the authority. Content and situation. For example, in a school classroom, the school teacher has authority. But outside that classroom, it's a different sort of authority. In the household of God, qualified men are to teach God's word and lead God's household with authority. And the household then chooses to submit and learn God's word together. In verses 13 and 14, Paul gives the theological grounding, the why. This pattern of teaching learning, it reflects God's good order from Genesis 2 to 3. Paul says Adam was created first. He is not saying Adam is superior. What he's saying here is Adam was given the responsibility to lead himself and to lead women, a woman, to obey God's word and trust his word. That was Adam's responsibility. That was his headship to help woman learn and himself learn by listening to God. Woman was deceived not because she was more susceptible or less educated. That's not true. No, no. Woman freely chose to reject God's good order. Eve freely chose to listen to the serpent. But we also know that Adam was held ultimately responsible because Adam refused to lead. This reversal of God's good order, Genesis 3, woman listening to the serpent, man sitting back into the shadows, that is what has led to the curse, to the warped mirror. It leads to men and women trying to dominate each other. Women who want to take control of men and men using their words and their force to hurt and dominate and treat women as less equal. But now, in God's redeemed community... We submit to God's word, and so we seek God's good order for our benefit and his glory. Well, that leads to verse 15. We've got no time for it, so let's move on. (laughs) It's not true. Can I just say, you can make a lot of mischief from this verse. 
please don't. Uh, it doesn't mean all women should have babies. It doesn't mean women are saved if they have babies. And it doesn't mean women should stay home. All of those are heresies, right? Now, Paul could be referring to Mary being the mother of Jesus who saves men and women. That could be one very good interpretation. And um, friends of mine think that's absolutely true. I think the more likely interpretation is this. God is calling women to embrace being God's women. That's what it's saying. That you are made and saved by God. And that's why he chooses the one thing that even in 2024 is undeniably gender unique. (laughs) As God's redeemed women who have been brought back under the lordship of Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian woman. I am now under the lordship of God. Paul's saying, don't shake your fists at God. Live out your salvation as God's women with faith and love and an outward focused heart like God. Well, God's household will always be radically different. The priests of Artemis or modern secularists, they're going to call us oppressive. They're going to call us dangerous. Yet they're wrong. Because Genesis 3 impacts them as much as us. The whole idea that our world has suddenly found equality is a total mirage. You are only equal if you agree with the elites. You are not equal if you disagree with the elites. Ask Kate Forbes in Scotland. Ask anyone who puts their head up and says something different. You are not equal. You are cancelled. And the Bible is not the creation of misogynists. Actually, Christians who regularly go to church, men who regularly go to church, I should say, have the lowest level of DV and the lowest level of wife and child abuse in the United States. The attacks on gender, on mothering, on femininity... It's not progression. It is devaluing our daughters and our sisters, our wives and our friends. But likewise, the church has many examples of power games. We are guilty of abuse. And more so, I think, we're we're guilty of lazy teaching on this. We need God's refining grace. You need God's refining grace and I do too. God's household will be radically different because it's shaped by this. We're not shaped by the warped mirror of the world. Jane Tua, Graham Benson, Brian uh, Brian say this, if God has spoken about gender and if he always speaks what is right and true and if his ways are always good and freeing for us, we ignore him at, at our peril. The gospel changes our focus from inward to outward to God's mission and his church. The gospel produces men who lead in humble prayer and help others to depend on God. That's godly manhood. The gospel compels us to submit to God's good design. And the gospel gives us grace. The gospel gives us um, forgiveness when we fail. and And it gives us wisdom to live out God's good design at OEC. So it is appropriate that we encourage men to be godly men and women to be godly women. And it is wrong to erase biblical gender roles or treat one as more important than the other. It is appropriate that men serve in teaching the corporate gathering on a Sunday. It is wrong that women are silenced on a Sunday and we never hear their voice. It is appropriate that we seek to serve God with everything we've got, but it is absolutely wrong to think I've got a right to do whatever I want to do in church. It's always what's best for God's household. It's appropriate that men serve as overseers of God's household. 1 Timothy 3 next week. 
But it's wrong for women not to have active roles in leadership in God's household, which they do across our church. It's appropriate for men to work hard in how we speak, how we lead, our attitudes, our heart, so we can communicate the equality and value of our sisters in Christ. But it is wrong for men to be so scared that we step back and go, it's not my problem. And it is appropriate to have serious conversations as a church about how we can make disciples as men and women. But it is wrong if we care about this more than God saving the world. God is good. His word is good. And he is working right here in OEC to produce a community of men and women working together in humility with a laser focus on God's mission for the world. Let's pray. Father, grow us as your household. Renew our commitment to your word. Help us be a rich, humble, courageous community, holding up and out your truth. Equip us to live as men and women in your strength for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.